Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Minnesota House of Representatives Transportation Finance and Policy Committee for this April 1st. Uh, we have um, three bills on the agenda, and uh, this is actually our final regular meeting of the uh, year, of actually the biennium. Uh, we'll be moving into uh, our omnibus markup and uh, uh, phase next week, and we'll talk about that at the end of the meeting. So um, with that, we'll uh, move on to our first item of business, which is the taking of the roll. Mr. Dodge. Chair Hornstein. Present. Hornstein, present. Vice Chair Cagle. Present. Cagle, present. Representative Petersburg. Petersburg, present. Petersburg, present. Representative Barr. Here. Barr, present. Representative Bernardi. Present. Bernardi present. Representative Elkins. Representative Elkins. Representative Frederick. Present. Frederick present. Representative Houseman. Present. Houseman present. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich present. Heinrich present. Representative Kosnick. Representative Kosnick. Representative Mason. Mason present. Mason present. Representative Murphy. Representative Murphy. Representative Nelson. Nelson present. Nelson present. Representative Olson. Olson present. Olson present. Representative Richardson. Present. Richardson present. Representative Torkelson. Torkelson present. Torkelson present. Representative West. Senator Belkins is present now too. Thank you, noted. Representative West. Present. West present. There is a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Mr. Our Chair, next Mr. Item Dodge. Of this, our next item of business is the approval of the minutes. And I believe we have uh, minutes from yesterday. Uh, oh. Representative Kosnick. I think he's maybe indicating that he's present, Mr. Dodge. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Kosnick. I have you, Mark, present. OK, um, uh, we have minutes uh, for approval from our March 31st meeting. Uh, Representative Petersburg, is there a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, if, if it's OK with you, I haven't had a chance to read them. If, if okay. we could do today's, let's, tomorrow's let's, next let's, meeting. Um, Let's do that at our next meeting. Thank you. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. OK, so we will uh, continue this item. Uh, members, um, so as I mentioned, we have three bills today, and we will be laying all of them over for possible inclusion. Our first uh, bill is House File 4708, Representative Jordan. Welcome to the committee. Hi, Mr. Chair. Hi there. Um, this is, I think, your second uh, appearance uh, before the Transportation Committee this year. Third, okay. No, no second this year, third this biennium, Mr. Okay, Chair. so you are, an, uh, you are now uh, officially an honorary member of the Transportation Committee. Uh, thank you very, very much for um, uh, sponsoring House File 4708 and uh, tell us about the bill. Mr. Chair, would you like me to talk about the bill or would you like to move? I you know understand what? Let's do that. Yeah, let's do the amendment first. Um, so uh, actually, members, I have an A1 amendment. And uh, this, oh, Representative Petersburg, is your hand up? Or is that uh, for, for, the, for, for the amendment? Oh, okay. Um, members, this is an uh, amendment. It came late. Uh, and uh, I did uh, have an opportunity to talk with um, Lead Petersburg this morning about it. But I felt that, that this concept uh, fits very nicely with the theme of Representative Jordan's bill, which is uh, local improvements uh, or, or improvements to the local bus system and transit systems. Uh, this is more about a, a, a transit system improvement, uh, but it relates to the suburban bus uh, lines. Um, and we have uh, later in um, our testimony is to test, uh, uh, Mr. Winder from the Suburban Transit Association will talk about micro transit. This is uh, basically a, a innovative program that uh, our suburban providers have done very successfully 
uh, in recent years where uh, it's an uh, uh, on-demand service similar to Lyft and Uber, and they can help uh, passengers complete their trips, uh, picking them up at park and rides and other, other locations where the, the buses drop them off, and they can complete their trips. And uh, we are, uh, this amendment simply uh, adds uh, uh, to our uh, budget uh, some discretionary monies to support this program. I'd ask for your support members. Um, Mr. Chair, may I comment? Please, Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I support the amendment going on the, on this bill. I, I think it's uh, it's nice to have actually some dollars into places where it's normally blank, and and so I, I appreciate that. I think that's that's wonderful. But I I did want to just share my frustration with the committee at how um, how many times we aren't getting fiscal notes as well as bills without uh, appropriations or blank dollars in amount that that just makes it difficult for us to really debate the bill the way that we should when we don't know how much money we're spending even though it may come later um, sometimes it may not come back to this committee etc so it's I, I just appreciate anything that we can do to kind of uh, pursue that and and of course the same thing is is the dis discussions that we've had in the past about lack of targets it's it's very difficult for those of us that aren't in the know uh, to, to really debate um, how we prioritize our funding when we don't know those targets. And Mr. Chair, I know a lot of this isn't your, isn't your fault, but I'm just saying uh, for the record, I, I would like to share my frustration with that. And I'm sure you share some of that as well. Uh, thank uh, you. Du duly noted. And uh, I will say at least for the first part of your question, um, it, it would be my intention to appropriate 1.3 a million dollars for this purpose and, and that may not be on the amendment but i wanted to um uh, at least put that on the record for you at least for the first part of your question represent petersburg it, it is on that amendment and that's what i appreciated that we finally do have some numbers okay all right uh representative kosnick uh thank you mr chair first of all i was having some technical difficulty i don't uh i got logged off the zoom when i when they were doing the call the roll call froze up on me. So hopefully you can call me present. We know that um, you're and present. Then, thank you. And then to follow up on Representative Petersburg's um, comments, do we know what the target is? Or can you share with the committee? I know the bill is about to be rolled out. What the target is for the transportation? We're, we're still, um, you know, formulating the, the omnibus bill. Um, and, uh, you know, we're kind of awaiting final word, uh, you know, in terms of a resolution at the Ways and Means Committee, but we'll have um, a number um, when we roll out the bill uh, next week. Next week, okay. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, the, you know, obviously that's a concern because as uh, we debate these bills and uh, the public wants to know and have some transparency of how their dollars are being spent um, or if they're gonna receive a, a tax refund and reform. But then previous to this committee starting, it sounds like there is an unusual change up in how the conference committees will be organized so that people with very little transportation uh, committee time may be conferees uh, on this stuff and, and same with other committees. And so can you talk about that process a little bit? Uh, we haven't been informed of that. And it, it's a little concerning as we're trying to, you know, do the people's work and, and uh, have a good discussion on what to do with a 9.3 something billion dollar surplus and how we can return that to taxpayers or uh, others want to spend a lot of that. Uh, can you comment a little bit and enlighten the committee uh, on that conference committee process that was discussed a little bit that we're not aware of? Yeah, Representative Kosnick, I am aware that, um, that you know, there will be uh, similar to, um, uh, I think in past years, there, there will be some certain committees that will be uh, paired with, with others and, and, you know, the bills will be, you know, likely combined. But I don't know the structure of the actual conference committees at, at this time. That seems quite unusual. Um, and th thank you for sharing your your thoughts on that uh, i guess we'll have to wait until the the majority and uh, leadership uh, enlightens the rest of uh the legislature and the public and the media because that's 
uh, quite unusual way uh, that we have not uh, organized conference committees in the past. And so I think it just unfortunately speaks to a, a real lack of transparency uh, on this whole budget process and begs the question of what the majority is trying to hide uh, the spending, uh, I'm guessing. I, I think the question is wide open is, you know, what the majority is trying to hide and why they're not being transparent with the public and with the rest of the legislature. And um, it's shameful. So uh, we'll look forward to learning more, uh, but we would appreciate a more transparent and uh, appropriate process. Uh, but thank you, Mr. Oh. Chair, for your comments. Members, I would like to thank you, Representative Kosnick. I'll call Representative Hausman is, uh, I, if this is, um, we will take your comments, Representative Hausman, but we, we really need to move on to get to our bills. Um, all I can say to the committee is that we are putting together an omnibus bill. We will hear it next week. Uh, there will be um, ample opportunity for the public to comment. Uh, the vast majority of this, of this bill, uh, I, I would, venture to guess almost all of it. Uh, there may be some last minute tweaks over the weekend. These have all been heard in the committee. They have been amended. We've had opportunities to amend these bills and discuss them thoroughly. So as far as the transportation committee is concerned, which is my uh, our area of jurisdiction, uh, we have had, I, I think, an excellent process. We have had uh, good participation by members and the public. I'm very proud of the work that we've done. And I think you'll see a bill that uh, you may disagree with uh, members of the minority, but uh, at least you will have seen or had the opportunity to discuss uh, just about every provision in this bill. Representative Hausman, and then we'll move on. I really don't want to talk very much right now about uh, conference Mr. committee. So if Mr. you can- Mr. Chair, I did, I did just want to correct the uh, perception. When I complained to leadership about this, I was told that really this was a Senate preference to organize in this way. So just so that you understand, this is, this is a negotiation between bodies. Okay. Well, uh, members, as you know, we uh, are in a uh, an institution that um, uh, is uh, necessarily, uh, in my opinion, I, I agree. I disagree with uh, our, our former governor Jesse Ventura. We are in a bicameral institution, and we are one of two uh, state legislatures in the uh, country that is divided, uh, and so. Again, we're, we're working through all these issues as best we can. Representative Jordan, uh, we have a motion on the table. Uh, this is the A1 amendment. Um, and uh, I would entertain, I would ask the uh, committee for a voice vote so that we can incorporate the A1 amendment into House File 4708. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, the motion prevails and um, we are on to House File 4708. Proceed, uh, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, members of the committee. As you all know, I proudly represent many transit users, and I myself often rely on the bus to get me to work, errands, shopping, and dining. We all agree that transit is a vital system that can be improved, and that is the idea that inspired House File 4708. To briefly recap the bill, in addition to the new amendment that uh, Chair Hornstein graciously offered, House File 4708 recognizes that even in times when Metro Transit needs to cut service, our local bus, bus system still needs to run better. If local buses could operate more efficiently, the pain of decreased service is blunted by improved speed and reliability. The working group created in this bill helps achieve that by bringing together the partners who have jurisdiction over the placement of bus lanes control over traffic signals, and consideration of bus stop placements on municipal and state roads that our local bus system travels on. This bill also provides funding for a continuation of the reduced fare program that Metro Transit launched in September and October of 2021. With gas prices rising, we know more Minnesotans will choose transit as their preferred means of transportation. This transition will be aided by low fares of $1 or 50 cents, and we have some testifiers here today to talk about why reduced fares are so important. Fair reductions help with both the economic and climate change challenges our state faces. A critical factor in making Minnesotans' transit experience safer and more comfortable is what the environment around them is like as they wait for the bus. And I can tell you as someone who has waited for the bus when it's been over 90 degrees or when it's been under 10 degrees, it 
matters very much um, how long you're waiting for the bus, depending on how comfortable you are. And that's why this bill provides 3.6 million for bus shelter improvements that will ensure riders are not subjected to the elements or are standing in the dark while they wait for bus service in the late hours of the night. And as popular as our BRT system is, it would be impossible to roll out additional lines faster than Metro Transit already is without further planning staff. This bill appropriates half a million dollars in an ongoing appropriation for new staff to plan for future bus rapid transit lines. And finally, this bill takes a significant step towards investing in clean, zero emission electric buses for Metro Transit to deploy on corridors that are the most affected by air pollution, which would also advance our climate goals and improve the health of our communities who live around those routes. And if you would like to have more information about um, air quality and air pollution, I recommend that everyone watch our um, our environment committee from this morning. We spent a lot of time talking about the effects that air pollution has um, on different communities across the state. But with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn over the rest of my presentation to transit users and advocates who can better provide context for what this bill does and why it is critical for us to pass now. Thank you very much, um, Representative Jordan. Let's go right into our testifiers. The first testifier is Sam Rockwell from Move Minnesota. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Rockwell, and please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. Thank you, Representative Jordan and members of the committee. My name is Sam Rockwell. Uh, I am Executive Director of MOVE Minnesota, and I'm here to enthusiastically support Representative Jordan's uh, Local Transit, uh, Local Bus and Transit Improvement Act. Now, among other things, uh, this act provides a critical bridge between our full BRT system, still years away, as Representative Jordan uh, uh, alluded to, and our current transit. Right, this bridge is critical because our current transit is it's too slow, it's too infrequent, but we can improve this service with interjurisdictional coordination uh, and minimal funds, both of which this bill establishes. Low cost measures like transit signal priority, uh, meaning getting green lights to buses when they get to an intersection, can speed up a bus trip 20%. Put that into context, a 20% increase in speed on just the high frequency network buses in the Twin Cities would save riders uh, based on 2019 numbers an estimated 780,000 hours a year on transit. That's 89 years worth of wasted time every single year. Um, and this bill puts a stop to that waste. And in the process, it addresses several things that have been uh, priorities of this committee. Better service increases ridership, which is critical uh, for addressing transportation sector climate emissions and also for maximizing the value of, uh, of state and regional investments. Uh, it shows respect and care for existing riders uh, who are disproportionately essential workers and community members of color, and it addresses safety concerns uh, stated by riders. Greater frequency uh, means less time waiting at a bus stop and adds eyes and a sense of community to the ride. Riders agree. Uh, we, we talked to uh, a transit rider, Allison, who wrote to us, I rely on transit to get me to work, church, meetings, grocery stores, and friends' houses. If my route's too slow, I'm more likely to decline an opportunity and miss out on the community building, supporting local businesses' involvements that makes living here so great. So the jurisdictions listed in this bill are ready uh, to get to work, as you can see from the letter submitted by Move Minnesota, which is signed by both Hennepin and Ramsey County. City of Minneapolis uh, let us know after we submitted the letter that they are also signing on and uh, Sean Kershaw, Public Works Director for St. Paul, is out on vacation until Monday and so that is why St. Paul is not signed on. Uh, but we've had great conversations with them and with Metro Transit staff and leadership. And I'm also grateful that Move Minnesota is listed uh, in the bill as part of the work group as we spent a year coordinating with these various uh, uh, jurisdictions and also building uh, the, the knowledge and support behind parts of the bill. Before closing, I do want to note Movement of Minnesota's support uh, for all the sections of the Local Bus and Transit Improvement Act. And in particular, in addition to other testifiers today, I want to note how important those reduced fares are uh, to many transit riders with whom Movement of Minnesota has engaged over the last months. And in their own words, to, to close, uh, Rider Sydney, who we talked to, notes that $1 fares are very important. Event goers might not notice a couple extra bucks on their fare, but to everyday riders, this represents a big increase in their transportation costs. Ray Alt, another transit rider, noted that without affordable, accessible transit, our neighbors who are most in need will literally be left in the cold. So thanks again for our consideration of this bill, uh, and I stand for any questions if there are any. 
Thank you very much, um, Mr. Rockwell. And I just wanted to personally thank you for bringing some of these ideas uh, to us and um, uh, your work uh, on uh, particularly the signal uh, prioritization issue over, over uh, the better part of a year uh, or more. And I would uh, direct members um, to the packets of letters and there's a, a pretty detailed letter uh, regarding that proposal uh, in addition to Mr. Rockwell's testimony. So thank you very much, Mr. Rockwell. Our next testifier is Claire uh, uh, Pardubsky. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. Uh, yeah, my name is Claire Pardubsky. I am a Minneapolis resident in the Prospect Park neighborhood, and I'm also a volunteer here with Move Minnesota and MN350. Uh, I'm a transit user when it works for me, and otherwise I do drive and bike to where I need to go. I'm also a recent graduate from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and before all of that, I did grow up in the state of Iowa, where there is no access to a transit system like the one that we have here in the Twin Cities Metro. Uh, I'm here today to voice my vocal support for HF 4708. Uh, as a student, transit worked for me to get around within about a one mile radius, and I didn't need a car for nearly four years. It was a pleasure to be a student here and fully utilize the system that we have available. I have warm memories of taking the BRT line to the movies with my friends and of walking, biking, busing, and light railing everywhere I needed to be. Um, however, as a graduate, I've quickly learned that the transit system has its shortcomings. And adding further bus rapid transit lines is critical to streamlining our existing transit system and building a more robust system for, um, as, as Sam already mentioned, all of the folks that are using transit on the daily, as well as it is critical for those that are currently driving to easily make a transition to using more transit and making further use of it, even if it's not every day. Um, it's, it's critical to reduce our reliance on self on our individually driven vehicles and uh, switch to more efficient transportation. Um, and finally, I just want to also emphasize, uh, I could not more strongly support the proposed reduced fares. Um, although temporary, these reduced fares really are critical for, for myself and others to see, to perceive fewer barriers to utilizing transit. Um, it makes transit a more convenient choice and uh, I'd also just like to add that um, I would encourage you all to continue considering bills like this that increase funding for transit and, and decrease the financial barriers to its use. It really does make a huge difference. And um, I would like to see a future where there are no transit fares and there's also uh, no uh, harm to fare evasion while fares still exist. Um, so thank you for putting forth this forward thinking policy in the meantime, and I hope you continue to push for reduced fares. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, our next uh, testifier is Victoria, uh, and again, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, Bos, uh, Bass. Uh, uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Victoria Bozzi. We were close. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm a transit rider and volunteer with Move Minnesota. And I, I'm speaking today in support of House File 4708. Um, I've been a transit rider in the Twin Cities for the last decade. And I'd like to just share how affordable and reliable transit is important to me because it's a determining factor in my health. Um, years ago, when I was a college student, the only way for me to buy fresh groceries was to ride the 16 bus down university. And I'd typically budget about three hours for grocery shopping because of bus frequency, time in transit and delays. And although spending three hours to get a backpack full of fresh food or healthy food seems like a lot, it was important to me. And without that direct bus, it would have been much more difficult. Um, and so that was about 10 years ago. Now we have the light rail and other bus lines around the cities, and there have been great improvements that have been made. Um, but over the years, I've still found that I struggle to make it to health appointments on time due to bus infrequency and delays. And many times I've missed important health appointments um, because of bus infrequency and delays, and, and I was left waiting out in the cold for a bus that came 30 minutes too late. 
And so last year, uh, fortunately, I had the opportunity to move to an apartment near several transit options. And um, I had considered every neighborhood in Minneapolis and uh, a, a certain section of St. Paul. And I landed on one of the very, very few neighborhoods that's well connected via transit to the things that I find important for health and well being, like uh, you know, a direct line to fully stocked grocery store rather than just a convenience store and a direct transit line to like medical clinics with within my insurance network and also spaces to be active, things like that. So my wish today is just to share that that's my story. And I wish that everybody would have access to affordable, reliable transit and access to the resources that they need for basic health and well-being, regardless of what neighborhood we live in. And so um, I believe that House File 4708 can bring us closer to that goal. And I thank you guys so much for considering uh, this bill. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, our next testifier is Zoe uh, Barani. Uh, please uh, state your name for the record. Welcome to the committee and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Zoe Barani, and I'm here to testify in support on the House File 4708, the Local Transmit Improvement Act. Um, I am an undergraduate student at Augsburg University, a leader with the Young Adult Coalition, and have served the past two years on the executive board of Augsburg Day Student Government as our environmental action officer. So students at Augsburg understand um, that to address the climate crisis, we need a just transition that puts an end to the fossil fuel era, creates new union jobs, and creates a better life for us all. Students also need um, affordability, affordability and easy ways to get around, which is why annually our student government is putting the majority of our green fee to transit passes for every student. We have stepped up to spend our student money for, to fund this. Now we need in, our institutions within government to also step up and do their part to address the climate crisis and make transit better and more accessible. In the metro area, 47% of transit riders do not have access to vehicles, many of whom are students, including myself. This bill ensures that we have faster, more reliable, and more comfortable options for essential functions such as grocery shopping, events off campus, field trips, and access to jobs off campus that will kickstart our careers. I and other students at Augsburg are excited to see how this bill would make transit and buses work better for students and for everyone with more reliability, capacity, capacity for bus rapid transit lines and electrification to address climate change. I urge the committee to pass these bill for these reasons. Thank you. Thank you so much for your wonderful testimony. Very much appreciated. Uh, our next testimony, and I haven't done well with names, but I think I'm gonna get this one right. Uh, Joshua Hodek from the Sierra Club. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Hornstein. You did get my name right and uh, committee mm -hmm. members. And happy Friday, happy first day of April and happy 30 days of biking. Uh, my name is Joshua Hodek. I'm a senior program manager with the Sierra Club Minnesota North Star Chapter. Uh, we represent 80,000 members and supporters in every county and every district uh, across our great state. And of course, uh, we're here to support House File uh, 4708, the Local Bus and Transit Improvement Act. Why? Because waiting for the bus is no joke. See what I did there? Sorry. Um, but seriously, we are in a climate emergency and extreme weather events are being experienced all over our state from flooding to drought. And the way so many Minnesotans get to where they need to go is, of course, by driving, which is fueling the climate change pollution uh, in our state and across the country more than anything else uh, is, is transportation. Uh, so we need to make clean transportation choices better, uh, and uh, especially for our shortest and our most polluting trips. So the Local Bus and Transit Improvement Act will make riding transit better. It builds on everything that we know. We know that faster buses on dedicated lanes with signal prioritization that, that Sam talked about are more desirable, they're more convenient, and they're more accessible for more people. We know that better bus stops 
are not only the Minnesota nice thing to do for people, it's the equitable thing to do for people. We know that making transit fares affordable or even free, like another testifier brought up, makes transit more accessible and it attracts more people to taking the bus or train and leaving perhaps the car at home, especially as gas prices uh, are skyrocketing. We know that zero emission electric buses are clean. They clean the air, they are quiet, they are cheap and easy to maintain. They're gonna save us money in the long run and they're better for the climate. We know that the bus rapid transit network with frequent surface service will attract more people to ride the bus. And lastly, we must leverage federal funding for transit improvements so that uh, we can get these improvements that we all so critically need. So thank you for the Local Bus and Transit Improvement Act and appreciate it. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Hodek. Uh, our next testifier is Eric Berger. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Hornstein and committee members. My name is Eric Berger and I live in Minneapolis. Uh, I'm testifying in support of Bill uh, HF4708. I'm a volunteer with the MN350 Transit Justice Team. Improving Minnesota's public transportation system is an important part of MN350's goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in, in Minnesota to prevent a worldwide climate catastrophe. For a number of years, I committed to work by car. I wasn't happy about it, but due to limited public transit options, it was really my only choice. I wasn't happy about it because I knew I was contributing to greenhouse gas pollution and because the commute itself was burdensome because often I was stuck in congested traffic, wasting time, burning fuel and getting nowhere. But if I had been on a rapid transit bus, for instance, I could have relaxed, logged into the internet, and maybe even gotten some work done. And with enough buses carrying commuters, the traffic congestion problems can be solved. The provisions in House Finding 4708 move Minnesota in the right direction to start making the vision of efficient, non-polluting, and reliable public transportation a reality in our state. This is the future of transportation in the age of climate change in our state and in all states. I ask for your support for House Funding 4708. Thank you, Chair Hornstein and committee members for giving me the chance to testify today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Berger. Our next testifier is Adriana Jarab, and then we'll hear from Trevor Turner, Luther Winder, and that will conclude our um, public testimony on this bill. Uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Ms. Jarob, and please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Hordenstein and committee members. Uh, my name is Adriana Jarob, and I'm a transit justice organizer for Minnesota 350. I've been looking forward to testifying in support of House File 4708. Uh, as a transit rider myself, and because of my work, I interact with a lot of transit riders. Last fall, along with Move Minnesota, our transit justice team, canvas riders on the blue and green line trains and the 21 and five bus routes, which are some of the most heavily used routes in the Metro. We talked to more than 200 riders and many of them rely on transit as their primary mode of transportation. Many of the needs that we heard from these riders are reflected in this bill, including the need for faster, more reliable buses, better bus stops and reduced fares. Last fall's reduced $1 fares were very popular with riders. And when we asked them what would be possible if $1 fares were the constant, some common themes were that people would be able to save money for other expenses or be able to make more trips using transit, including to see their families more often. And what was really striking to me is that a lot of riders uh, emphasize the importance of low fares for the collective good that it makes using transit more accessible for everyone and that it's necessary for people who don't have a car or can't drive. Speeding up buses with bus lanes and signal priorities is also a must. Currently, many riders deal with long commutes, some spending several hours a day, especially if they're traveling to or from suburbs to the cities. 
uh, when we talk to writers who already use transit to get to events, a lot of them would like to use transit to the, uh, for their commute, but it's prohibitively slow compared to driving, or they've experienced issues with reliability. So it seems that people already want to use public transit. They just need to be able to trust that it will make them late to work, school, or a doctor appointment. And lastly, bus shelter improvements are also very needed. Even with improvements in reliability and frequency, people are still gonna spend some time waiting at stops. And this is a concern that I've heard, especially from older riders and riders with disabilities. Once you've gotten to a stop, you really need a shelter with a bus or with a bench so that you have a place to rest until your bus arrives. Uh, we believe that bus stops should be dignified and safe in all weather for all riders. The proposals in this bill are exciting because they mean improving the system for people who already use Metro Transit, and it also means more people will want to. These changes will have significant positive impacts for everyone in our communities, but especially for, uh, for frequent riders, low-income riders, older riders, and riders with disabilities. So I ask you to vote in favor of House File 4708. Um, thank you for your time, and thank you, Representative Jordan, for bringing this bill forward. Thank you very much, Ms. Jarab. Uh, and then uh, we now have Trevor Turner from the Minnesota Council on Disability. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Hornstein, and thank you, members of the committee. Um, I'd also like to thank Representative Jordan for carrying this bill. It's very important. Uh, my name is Trevor Turner, and I am the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. I'm also legally blind and utilize Metro Transit as my primary mode of transportation in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, transportation is essential to a thriving community and a strong economy. However, here in the Midwest, our cities were designed around the use of cars, which unfortunately is inaccessible to low income residents and many people with disabilities, including myself. We rely on public transit to be mobile and to be integrated into our communities. Therefore, it's important to have a well-funded public transit, transit system. Um, I've had the privilege of living in other cities around the world with extensive public transit systems. So I've seen personally the potential of mass tra public transit. The thing I liked most about those transit systems was that everybody used it from elderly grandmothers to school children to white collar professionals and fa factory workers. I never felt excluded from my community because my community used the same transit system that I used. I do wanna commend uh, Metro Transit for operating a reliable public transit system with the resources they are given. Unfortunately, they are still un underfunded. Um, in the Metro area, 47% of transit riders do not have access to a vehicle and many of whom are people, Minnesotans with disabilities. This bill ensures that those who are transit dependent will have a faster, more reliable and more comfortable commute by improving existing local bus service, which is the heart of the transit system. This bill is also continues a successful fare reduction program implemented by Metro Transit in September of October of last year. We know that uh, reductions in fares make a huge difference in the weekly budgets of Minnesotans who use transit every day to get to work, school, medical appointments and running errands. This is money saved in the pockets of those who need it the most. Bus rapid transit ridership had the smallest drop in ridership of any level of service during the COVID-19 pandemic. It is also becoming quickly the favorite level of service for transit riders. So additional planning dollars are critical for Metro Transit to continue to expand the bus rapid transit network. Bus rapid transit helps reduce the time it takes to get across the Metro area, making Metro Transit more efficient. When you invest in public transit, you invest in the disability community, you invest in jobs and the economy, and you give people more choices for better places to work and live in the communities of their choice. You reduce congestion and pollution as well as save lives. When more people use public transit, accidents are redu reduced dramatically. Public transit allows cities to be denser and more pedestrian friendly, and it makes it easier for low vision people like me to get around to be a part of the Twin Cities community. So please support House File 4708 and support Minnesota with Disabilities. Thank you, Chair Hornstein, and thank you to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Turner. Our last testifier um, is uh, Mr. Uh, Luther Winder from Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. And I've asked um, Mr. Winder just to um, give us a, a short um, uh, overview of the uh, micro transit program. Uh, we haven't really had a, a lot of information on this. Um, and uh, I know that they uh, 
We had some brief discussion last year, uh, but I find this to be very innovative. Uh, it has a successful track record, and I think is an integral part of uh, a future uh, transportation and transit system. So look into the future with um, uh, this microtransit overview. Uh, so we'll do this, we'll have, uh, again, a brief uh, several minute uh, presentation for Mr. Winder, and then we can get to questions of the author and uh, discussion to the bill. So with that, Mr. Winder, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Um, good afternoon, this is Luther Winder, Chief Executive Officer for Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. Um, can everyone see my screen? My um... Yes, well, I can see it quite well, and we can see you too. Thank you. Um, just want to also um, just state my support uh, for this legislation for House Law 47008, as well as the amendment for microtransit. I also do just want to highlight that, um, especially when it comes to Minnesota Valley, we do about over 35% of our service is suburban local service. And after, BR, and after BRT during the pandemic, suburban local was the highest performing um, ridership type. Um, by percentage right after BRT. And we'll explain why the need for microtransit also fits right into that as well too. So we're thankful for the inclusion um, on the signal prioritization, um, funding for any type of unfair um, um, offset, which we do support, um, as well as we're looking forward in the future to also continue to upgrade our shelters, as well as um, I do continue to work also too on our zero transmission, zero emission plan that we're doing here at the agency. So that with the microtransit, very brief presentation. Um, so, just understand that um, Southwest Prime was the first of its kind to start a microtransit system back in 2015. Um, understanding that um, during that particular time, microtransit was really with its infancy. Um, they were requested and had um, and went to places such as requests as far as New Zealand, understanding how we were doing in this region, as well as understanding when looking at what you see in San Francisco, some other West Coast and East Coast properties about how they can look to model their service, their microtransit services. Um, similar to what um, Southwest started in 2015. Um, microtransit originally started in, the, in our in the suburban communities as really as the first and last mile um, for work commuters, but it's grown to mobility lifeline for many individuals living and working in suburbs who have serious mobility needs. Virtually all demographics of segments use microtransit, but it's not emergency medical for groceries, to go to food bank services, work connections, to major employment centers, um, needed for disadvantaged senior populations. Um, the service operates, uh, as um, Representative Holmstein, and thank you, uh, operates similar to an Uber or Lyft style. Um, customers are able to, unlike with Uber and Lyft, customers are actually able to use an app, but they can also call in and book their, book their trips as well. Um, some of the highlights of microtrans, I'm just the expansion and the growth that we've seen since its, inter since its introduction. Um, Southwest Prime currently um, is operating at the highest ridership level, even compared to before the pandemic. They've seen a 120 increase in ridership since 2021 and a 337% increase since 2020. Um, Minnesota Valley service we operate, our Connect service, which we operate, started our service in 2019, we've seen 16 months of continuous growth. Um, after October 21st, after after October 2021, when we actually expanded the service to Egan, we've seen a 50% growth in ridership. Um, our Maple Grove Transit, or My Ride, they expanded, um, they did some expanded service in 2022, actually a few weeks ago, um, to Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, and they also now serve the food, um, food shelf in Rogers. And our um, Plymouth Metrolink, which is the Clicken Line, um, their total um, ridership has increased by 2% over the last 12 months, and they're currently at 95% pre um, COVID ridership levels. Talking about microtransit, the coverage, um, it goes, I always want to make sure the community understands that it goes beyond our traditional um, STP suburban provider um, service boundaries, really to meet the needs of our customers, the communities within the region. Um, some of the cities served right now in some capacity by our microtrans systems are Oslo, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, Maple Grove, Plymouth, Egan, Apple Valley, Burnsville, Rosemont, Savage, Rogers, Shakopee, Eden Prairie, Chanhaskin, Chaska, Carver, and Victoria. And if you have a conversation with any of the chief executives, including myself, we can give you a host of 10 other cities um, that, we, that, we, that we see need to expand to, as well as the increase and expansion of services in our current cities that we currently do serve. And that's where funding with this amendment, this funding is really important. 
all funding really is important to really um, help and support the change in demographics they need within the system. Um, it's important to understand that since 1996, um, there have been about 35, um, 350,000 affordable housing units that have been built in the Twin Cities. 25% of those housing communities, 25% of those of affordable housing has been built in our 12 city STA service area. 18% has been built in the core, and 57% has been built in the remainder of the region. So that means about 80% of affordable housing is built in um, less dense suburban style, suburban edge um, um, communities where microtransit really thrives and really where we seem to continue to see this need and this growth. Um, additional funding is needed for um, fleet modernization expansion on um, providers such as Minnesota Valuable Use and retire on uh, interviews for live cutaways, which, um, which, which are less efficient, um, higher maintenance costs and upon the breakdowns. Um, as we continue to see this growth in ridership, it's related, it's um, even in our current service areas, the pockets that we're serving, um, with, without available vehicles, we're seeing longer wait times and service becomes less, um, less reliable over time when that happens. There's a need for service expansion and hours expansion. Um, one thing about microtransit, similar to fixed run in the sense that some, some systems don't serve the full community, the full city. They may serve a particular subsection or a particular service area of that community. So um, there's a need, obviously, to expand to serve our full, our full member cities that we currently serve now, to um, look at addition of late hour um, service, especially when I look at, think about some of our communities as we see our third shift um, individuals that don't have access to transit or ways to get, to get home, as well as, um, as I talked about before, expansion to neighboring suburban community. And finally, but not least, funding is always needed for technology modernization and customer amenities. Um, these um, improvements to our apps that we currently use for customers to book. Um, and we're sharing what we just um, entered into agreement just a few weeks ago. I think it's going to be exciting for the region um, who we're going to be utilizing. As well as um, there's also a need for um, the modernization of our, at our, some of our current transit stations to provide designated waiting areas and amenities for customers who are waiting for their micro transit trips. That, that concludes my Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. Thank you. Thank you for that very thorough and informative uh, presentation. Now, members, we can uh, go to questions of any of the testifiers and discussion to the bill. Um, let's see, my, my screen is blank. Uh, here we go. All right, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, and I think this is for Mr. Winder, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for for allowing me to ask this question. So in your presentation, you talk about uh, the amount of ridership increases and the coverage that you co that you cover as well, uh, but you didn't talk anything about what the fares are, what kind of costs each rider has. Uh, do you have any statistics to indicate, you know, what, what kind of oh. cost uh, trip they have? Definitely. Uh, so Minnesota Valley, we charge about $4, we charge $4 each way for fare. Um, and with that once they, um, that's each way, and we provide them a, um, a, a pass that they're able to ride fixed route services in the region for free during the time they travel. So that's why it's been a really good value for individuals. What we continue to see is the bulk of our, the bulk of our service trips actually go from a pickup from a residence or a business and actually go to a transit station in order so they can use on um, connecting services. Um, so, so how would that compare to Petersburg? Same? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Uh, so how would that compare, uh, if you would uh, continue to answer questions here, how would that compare to like uh, a pass for a bus and, and the distance that would be traveled in a bus line? Uh, definitely. So what we what we look at from a fair, um, if you look at express service, um, you're at off uh, peak is about 325, so about 75 cents more um, that, we, that we charge, obviously, for this, for this level of service. Um, when it comes to a traditional fixed route, these, these trips normally, um, especially when it comes to Southwest Prime, are a lot less than what you pay for Metro Mobility or other demand response, demand response um, level serve, level trips, under $35 or $30 or less per, um, per passenger trip. Um, and it really, is the, it really is more cost effective than fixed route because you're really serving locations that are less dense. And I think that's why I wanted to allude to when we looked at the affordable housing and disbursement of how a senior population affordable housing is being dispersed around the region. It's really sometimes in less dense areas where it may not be practical or financially feasible to put a fixed route, a fixed route bus in, um, providing this point-to-point -point service to connect them to some of the high-frequency stations is the most cost-effective. Representative Petersburg. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Winder, for that. And, and I, I will just ask one question of, of the author or anybody else in regards to uh, uh, this bill and, and maybe have some questions later. Uh, I understand the need for planning and getting some of these bus routes planned and, and developed earlier, uh, but I also am very much cognizant of how uh, we fund um, the, the busing and, and trans, transit uh, costs as well. And my, my question is, how does reducing fares when we already have trouble making ends meet in regards to transit, how does that promote planning uh, for future bus routes? Uh, I, I don't get the connection there. So maybe if somebody could kind of explain and help me kind of get my arms around why we want to reduce fares when we know already that the fare is not paying for the cost of operating the bus. Um, either uh, perhaps Representative Jordan or, or one of the testifiers may want to uh, answer that. Um, sure, Mr. Have... Chair. I can say briefly um, that, and then I think Mr. Rockwell might have better um, numbers than I do, but we want people to take the bus. We want people to have transportation options that are available to them. And a lot of times people aren't willing to take chances on something unless it's cheap. Um, we also know that people right now are struggling with um, inflation and their bottom line. And so making sure that the bus is cheap and affordable for people is a way to get more people introduced to Metro Transit, transit um, and to riding the bus and realize that, hey, this is pretty nice. I can read my Kindle or I can chat with my mom. I talk to my mom a lot on the bus, um, which is, I think she appreciates when I pick up the phone and call her. But there's other things that I think people find that they like about it if they're willing to take a chance on lower fares. But I don't know if Mr. Rockwell would um, like to talk a little bit more about how that's going to influence planning or if there's another testifier who would prefer to go into more um, detail. Thank you, uh, Representative Jordan. I, I, I guess um, if there's some, I, I would ask maybe Mr. Rockwell to comment to, perhaps further about the, the fare reduction piece. And Representative Petersburg, um, I had suggested the uh, uh, $500,000 uh, appropriation for BRT planning, and I, I'd be happy to answer that question, Representative Petersburg. But why don't we, um, why don't we hear from Mr. Rockwell? Uh, I, would, I would just underscore what uh, Representative Jordan said, that, that you know, the thing that we can do to make our transit system healthy in every possible way, right, both as a welcoming uh, experience, as something that can address uh, some of the disparities in our, our region, and also to make it, uh, uh, you know, as efficient from a, a kind of an economic and ridership standpoint is to bring that ridership back. I mean, I want to be clear, we have a lot of riders right now. The average ridership per day in 2021, even though transit ridership is way down, was over 98,000 rides a day. Um, those are Metro Transit's numbers, and that's more than uh, the population of Moorhead and Mankato put together. It's more than the population of Duluth, and that's every single day. Um, and so there are a lot of transit riders, but we do want to build that ridership back up. And be, having incentives to bring people back onto the bus um, is, is one way of doing that. And then ensuring that the experience that people have on transit uh, is, is really good when they do get on the bus is critical to keeping them there. So we have fair incentive and we have uh, initiatives in this bill uh, to keep them there. And also, uh, you know, we, we have had some uh, conversations and, and, and Representative Park team might fill this out as well. We've had some conversations with, uh, with Metro Transit staff just on being able to fast track the bus rapid transit build out as well. We heard about how well that ridership is going right now. And one of the big things in fast tracking that is having enough planning staff on staff long-term at Metro Transit, being able to hire those folks to be able to plan more than one line at a time. Uh, and so that's important to kind of moving this whole thing forward as well. Yeah, and Representative Petersburg, I, I don't think I need to comment further because uh, I think um, uh, Mr. Rockwell uh, addressed this issue of planning. And I'll just say that, you know, we heard, uh, uh, test, we heard uh, bills from Representative Hansen for uh, the G line and Representative Jordan for the H line arterial BRT earlier, uh, I believe last month. And, um, you know, I wanted to see whether there were some other uh, letters of the alphabet we could uh, get moving on. 
And um, Metro Transit said, well, you know, we'd like to, but we, we need the, the staff to plan them because, you know, there's a lot of work that has to go in even before you uh, generate a bonding proposal or a cash proposal before the legislature. So uh, that was the figure that, that they gave us for that ongoing planning because, you know, we want to build out that system. We want to cover all the letters of the alphabet eventually and have the best arterial BRT system in the country. Represent Petersburg, uh, if you have a follow-up, and then Representative yes, Cosmo. Uh, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll just have two final comments. Uh, one is, um, so if I understand the way we count ridership, uh, a ride is considered anytime you, you get on a bus or get off a bus. So if, you're, if you have to make uh, a transfer um, someplace and then a transfer back, you're actually, your one trip is, is actually for ridership. So. So that makes a difference. But what I would comment on is just because we reduce the fares doesn't mean the bus trip is cheaper. It just means that somebody else is picking up the difference. Uh, unfortunately, the state doesn't print money. Uh, it can only pay for things out of what we take away from others. And so whatever, whatever the fare doesn't cover, uh, somebody else around you is picking up that tab. And so we do need to understand the need for helping uh, those that, that need help uh, but we also need to understand that there are a lot of people that are getting a benefit that could actually pay more for fares. So I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me talk. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I guess I do want to just quickly recognize uh, our opening comments. I was not um, disparaging your role as, as a chair of this committee being uh, not transparent. I, I appreciate your role and the leadership you do provide, even though we have this policy disagreement. So I just want to make that sure uh, publicly known. I don't think you took it that way, but um, wanted to mention that. But I, I was wondering uh, if the author uh, or one of her testifiers, but uh, what is the uh, subsidy uh, per ride on some of these micro transit rides? Um, I guess that's the question. What, what's the what's the subsidy the operating loss per ride? Uh, if she probably, well, I, I'm yeah. guessing, might not know, but Mr. My Winder, guess is perhaps. Mr. Winder. Mr. Winder could probably answer that. Representative Kosnick, should we bring him up? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Winder. Yeah, it, it varies by it varies by his provider, and we can send that information over to you. What we do, um, I heard Minister, uh, we use a bellwether to look at what metro abilities. Um, average cost per passenger is, and we try to um, match her. We try to match her, um, obviously, not exceed, but be a lot lower than that. So we're, our subsidy per passenger looks anywhere between thirty-five dollars or under. Um, but as we continue to increase ridership and increase passenger hours, we've seen that growth. We continue to see that number trend. Um, that number continue to trend down. Um, but I can get you the information for the other providers as well. But I'm, um, Mr. Just Mr. Uh, Chair, well, Representative Kosnick. Yeah, that, that's great. Thanks. So it's about $35 a ride, if I heard that correctly, or under is the operating loss? No, per hour. It's about, we're looking at passengers, but we're looking at from a from subsidy firm per hour standpoint. But I can get per you- Per hour? Yes. So what we try to do is, at any time from a microtransit standpoint, we want to make sure we get as many people on the bus in any given hour. That's why groupings are very important to us, and that makes, and that makes, um, and that makes a difference. So if we're able to do more passengers, just like in subsidy per passenger when it comes into a when it comes into a fixed route standpoint. So our standpoint, when we look at it, we look at it from an hour um, and for, for a, and sometimes we be a passenger. Southwest Transit, I think from my understanding, they're about under $25. Um, we've been under $35 um, at any given time. Um, Metro Ability, I think a lot of, um, from last time, this is off my head, was $60, but I can get you all of that and, and, and get that submitted to you to make sure those numbers are accurate. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Kosnick. Okay, well, th thank you. That was informative. So it's per uh, thirty-five dollars per hour loss or so. But uh, I understand. So you're saying that is it, so it is more expensive than Metro Mobility, which I think you said was twenty-five dollars per no, hour. No, Metro Mobility is sixty dollars. Oh, sixty. Okay, sixty six L. Okay, interesting. Okay. Um, and then, Mr. Chair, I guess I would, you know, this is an interesting discussion, as we always have here in transportation. And I'd remind the committee and the public that a couple of years ago, there was an amendment uh, in, in the Transportation Committee to have uh, free ridership. 
And it was, I, I don't think anybody voted for it because we all understand that there, there comes a cost with that. Somebody's got to pay for it. There is no free rides. There's no free lunch. And if I remember, it was like $13 million, or maybe that's even low uh, per year as an operating um, loss to Met Council. Um, I double check that number. Maybe it was 130 million. I, I don't remember. But the point is, is that everybody in the committee understood that the even the the, the fare box recovery and the fares that people pay uh, are a necessary part of the transit system. And when we reduce that, we exacerbate that problem even more. And so I, you know, somebody's got to pay somewhere. And what I'm hearing is that uh, all these testifiers, they just want somebody else to pay. And out of uh, the surplus, uh, now they're seeing it uh, as an, an opportunity to have somebody else pay even more. Um, I would also remind them, as I've asked on the Met Council about this, uh, you know, for youth and, and seniors, uh, you can get a $1 ride in Metro Transit right now. And during rush hour, it's only $2.50. If you want to ride the express bus during non-rush hour, it's only a dollar as well. Um, and if you have uh, persons with disability, rides are a dollar all the time for regular and express routes. So we do have mechanisms in place uh, to help offset uh, those that need uh, those uh, that need a, even a little bit extra help. So um, I, I appreciate the conversation, but it, we've we've had it before, and it, uh, I don't believe that this bill has a Senate companion either. And so I, I just don't see this going anywhere. Uh, but the, you know, I made the comment yesterday when we build out these lines, uh, whether they're on on tires or rails, uh, the local partners I feel uh, need to participate in the operating loss if we want to help them uh, build out some of the capital infrastructure. That's a question for the legislature. But I think the legislature and the state of Minnesota should move to a mode where the operating losses are borne upon those local partners that want this service uh, so much more uh, and uh, would help our, our state budget so that we can provide relief for people that are facing inflation, uh, whether it's in gas or food, where they can educate their kids and, and do it that way instead of continuing to grow and grow government more. So uh, thanks for the discussion, but I don't see this as going anywhere. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Representative Kosnick. Uh, are there any additional member questions? I don't see any. Uh, we do have, uh, I think maybe uh, Mr. Hodek uh, wanted to make some brief comments perhaps in response to a question. So it's uh, I'll call on you, uh, Mr. Odek. I know you already gave your testimony and you weren't necessarily identified as someone to answer the question, but you're very knowledgeable. So I will uh, allow you to uh, make a statement uh, quickly and then we'll move on to our next bill. Mr. Hodek. Just immediate response. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Hornstein, for the opportunity to respond. Two things. One is we heard testimony after testimony after testimony that yes, we do have options for people, but they're not working. And that's what we heard this morning. Uh, the second thing is our roads are subsidized, 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 just as much as our transit is, is subsidized. Our roads are subsidized by public uh, dollars that come from property taxes. Uh, they're not user taxes. The only true user taxes we have is the gas tax in our state. So I just needed to get that out there. Um, right. um, thank you for the opportunity. What, what, thank you, um, members. I am going to allow Representative Kosnick to respond, and then we are going to move on to our next bill. Uh, this is a very good discussion, and I think we're seeing the contours of a, of a good debate here. But Representative Kosnick, you get the last word, sir. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I appreciate uh, the people that take the time to testify in committee and that uh, to participate in the member discussion sometimes it exacerbates uh, the time that we we have here. But uh, certainly incorrect. People that drive on our roads pay the gas tax. Uh, they may pay property taxes. Uh, they also 
pay motor vehicle sales and lease taxes that pay for the operating cost of our road system. But in addition, we also pay for a lot of Metro Transit and Metropolitan Council taxes that many members may not even use. And so I think uh, it would be important that we understand that. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. But I, I get a little frustrated when testifiers um, can be a little inaccurate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Representative Kozik. And uh, we appreciate the very good debate and, and testimony we've had on this bill. Very, very important issues raised. Uh, and uh, I will give the final, final word to our author, Representative Jordan, and then we'll move on to Representative Bolden's bill. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you to all the testifiers and uh, members for paying attention. I know it's Friday. I think it's sunny. Maybe it's nice out. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think that we all agree that it's important to have a system that works. These are improvements to our transit system, which is a system that must work. If we kept doing things the way we did them, we'd get the same results. And we know that we can and that people deserve to have a better transportation system. And this is an investment in that. So I ask for your support as this bill um, moves forward. I understand it's being laid on the table today, but thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you for um, this excellent bill, Representative Jordan, for all of your work on transportation and transit issues and uh, much appreciated. And we are laying House File 4708. We're laying it over for possible inclusion in omnibus transportation bill. So thank you again, Representative Jordan. And we are now moving on. Uh, thank you, Representative Bolden, for waiting patiently. Uh, our next bill is um, House File 4690, and this is funding for Greater Minnesota Transit. Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Bolden, and uh, we look forward to hearing about your bill. Thank you, and good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. I am grateful to be uh, before you in this committee today to present House File 4690. This bill proposes a $10 million investment into transit systems in greater Minnesota. This investment would allow regional transit providers to improve rider services, better connect existing bus lines, and produce cleaner buses. Minnesota has a strong network of transit providers across the state. However, there are still many gaps in services. Many systems currently need additional funding for facilities to keep buses inside year round as they move to electrification, which is important, higher vehicle costs, new or improved facilities and charging infrastructure would be needed. Those higher costs require a higher local share. Hiring additional drivers and retaining current drivers is an ongoing operational issue, which this bill does not solve, but it would allow funds to be used as one-time bonuses for recruitment and retention. Transit systems also need new technology so systems can operate more efficiently. And providers are also faced with spiking fuel costs. These issues can be addressed with this one-time investment and will be more attainable with a, local, a lower local match. Everyone across the state deserves convenient, clean, accessible, and affordable transportation, and this bill would be a step in that direction. Uh, so with me today are four testifiers from Greater Minnesota, and with your permission, Mr. Chair, I would turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Representative Bolden. And members, in case you're wondering, um, you know, uh, we do have extra time today, so I'm not going to be rushing any of the testifiers of these bills. Uh, they are su substantial, and so we want to hear from folks. We do have until 3.30. Of course, we could end earlier, but uh, I want to make sure that everybody testifies. You're not rushed, and uh, we get the uh, questions and answers from the committee uh, that uh, each of these bills uh, deserves in terms of consideration. So. Uh, and with, but I still would encourage a, a crisp testimony as well. So our first testifier is Ryan Daniel, uh, and he is the CEO uh, of the St. Cloud Metro Bus and president of the Minnesota Public Transit Association. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Daniel. Chair, during my seven years as Metro Bus CEO, I've had many opportunities to see the value Metrobus brings to the central Minnesota community it serves. Metrobus is an important conduit for community members to get to jobs, education, medical appointments, recreation, and so much more. Through partnerships with the St. Cloud State University and the St. Cloud Technical and Community College, we provide free rides for students, enabling them to advance their careers and integrate into the community. 
As the current Minnesota Public Transit Association president, I've had the privilege of seeing the similar roles and partnerships our agencies throughout Minnesota have within their communities. However, not all transit systems have the same level of local resources. This bill provides one-time money for a variety of potential projects to advance transit in greater Minnesota, and importantly, only requires up to a 5% match rather than the 15 to 20% systems are required to fund locally. Despite the incredible importance of public transit agencies within their communities, we are dealing with many challenges, including delays in receiving new bus orders to replace old vehicles and or expand service, resulting in increased maintenance costs. Increases in costs for everything from fuel to new parts and equipment to communication and marketing resources for customers. In addition, the driver shortages are taxing current workforces and creating situations where it is necessary to reduce service. I will use the circumstances at Metrobus as an example of what many transit agencies are experiencing. Metrobus has consistently had nine to 12 fixed route city bus openings and six to seven dollar ride paratransit small bus openings since October of 2020. Fixed route has a total of 65 positions equating to 13 to 18% unfilled positions. Dollar Ride has a total of 31 positions equating to 19 to 23% unfilled positions. To combat these shortages, we are constantly innovating and developing new initiatives to bring in employees. New programs and campaigns include $1,000 hiring bonus implemented in 2021 and paid in increments over the first year of employment. Creating a paid CDL training course, allowing us to hire future bus drivers without CDLs or CDL permits. Holding hiring open houses to bring in candidates and immediately get them into the hiring pipeline. Numerous digital, social media, and print and billboard advertising campaigns exclusively promoting employment opportunities at Metrobus. While many of these initiatives have been successful, Applicant pools are extremely low, and we continue to see resignations and or retirements roughly matching the number of new employees we are able to hire. Most of our rural transit systems do not have the financial ability to provide hiring bonuses to recruit and retain drivers or staff to develop marketing campaigns or resources to implement them. Many of their budgets will suffer under the increased fuel costs and now the 30% increase in vehicles already on order. As we seek to move to cleaner buses, the cost of those buses are more significant and they are the infrastructure costs that go along with that. This bill with one-time money will help many systems, particularly with the low match. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Daniel, for your testimony and your work in St. Cloud, much appreciated. Uh, our next testifier is Nick Lemmer, the uh, Communications Director for the Rochester Public Transit System. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Chairman Hornstein and members, my name is Nicholas Lemmer. I'm Communication Coordinator with Rochester Public Transit and currently serve as the Treasurer for the Minnesota Public Transit Association. I'd like to begin by thanking Representative Bolden for authoring House File 4690 and also thank the chairman and members for inviting me to appear before you today in support of it. Rochester Public Transit, like many transit agencies in the state, is in a situation where we are able to fund operation, thanks in part to federal emergency aid, but are in a more tenuous position regarding our capital investments. As you know, small transit uh, agencies like ours are required to cover 20% of the cost of their operations with local sources, such as fare revenue. Due to historically strong ridership in Rochester and fare box recovery exceeding this 20%, Rochester has been able to build a balance of return, retained earnings and use that to fund our local portion of important capital investments. The COVID-19 pandemic has interrupted this ridership trend in a devastating way, reducing our fare revenue to below the 20% cost of operations. And this has triggered a domino effect by threatening to deplete our retained earnings, limiting our ability to address the backlog of capital investments, 
and slowing the pace of us implementing important technological and sustainability improvements. So one-time grants will provide us with the strategic capital funds to help win back passengers we once counted as loyal customers, to meet the growing commuting needs of our local workforce, and to provide an essential service to the many transit-dependent individuals in our community. People like Amina, a new U.S. citizen who uses public transportation to get to work and school. She's no longer dependent on others and is enjoying her freedom as a new citizen and her independence and ability to navigate our city. And Marcus, he's working to complete his GED. He can now attend school while working and uses the opportunity on board to study while he rides. Transit is improving his classroom attendance and it's allowing him to improve his life. Just last week, Rochester Public Transit took delivery of two battery electric transit vehicles manufactured right in St. Cloud, Minnesota. The bill before you will help us continue to make strategic investments in technologies and facilities that will help us sustain this momentum towards a cleaner, more sustainable and user-friendly service. Members of our statewide association have also described challenges they are facing in greater Minnesota. We hear about agencies who pass up state and federal grant opportunities because of an inability to come up with that required local matching funds. Like Rochester, they have aging vehicles and other capital needs that might otherwise go unmet. House file 4690 by providing a one-time opportunity to invest in capital projects with a lower, lower required local contribution has the potential to make a significant impact on the lives of those who depend on transit in greater Minnesota. It will allow small agencies who've thought about cleaner and more sustainable operations take that first step. Members, I truly believe this one-time investment will have a lasting impact on the viability and the vitality of public transit in greater Minnesota. I sincerely thank you for taking up this legislation before you and for the opportunity to speak in support of it. Thank you very much, Mr. Lemmer. And our next testifier is Jim Wolter, Director of Rolling Hills Transit. Welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Bernstein. Yes, good afternoon to all. Uh, my name is Jim Wolter. I'm the Transit Director for um, Rolling Hills Transit. And Rolling Hills Transit is a transportation program run by SEMCAC. SEMCAC is located down in Rushford, Minnesota. It's a community action agency been around since 1966. Um, our transportation, we strive to provide the necessary transportation using both a public transit um, uh, demand response, as well as a volunteer uh, driver-based um, ride. We operate in southeastern Minnesota. The public transit operates in Dodge, Olmstead, Winona, Fillmore, and Houston County. And then our volunteer driver, Additionally to those two is in Waseca and uh, Steele County. Primarily rural, we're operating in, uh, you know, cities Houston, uh, Hayfield, Rushford, Manorville, uh, cities around 100,000, or excuse me, 1,000 in population, as well as Dodge Center, Spring Valley, Caledonia, St. Charles, there in the 2,700 to uh, 3,500 people. Uh, population base. And then our largest areas of service is in Byron Castle and Stuartville, where it's about uh, 5,500 to 6,500. So we're truly operating in the area of rural populations there. We currently have um, 15 vehicles and these, uh, you know, spread out over that um, five county area. Our, our volunteer driver program, we have 62 volunteer drivers. They log on average about 22,000 hours, a little over almost 23,000 hours a year in volunteer hours, um, giving about uh, 13,000 trips a year and logging just under half a million miles a year. The public transit side of it, we operate about 55, 53 to 55,000 a year in, in rides that we um, do annually there. Um, as well as we have a um, our facility here that I'm at in Casson is where that's operated at, uh, that we house the administrative part. Uh, um, housing for half of the fleet is here, and then the rest of the fleet is out and about in the other um, uh, counties. 
But uh, this bill, some of it where I see this one-time appropriation is kind of the, the challenges of a local match. We operate under a 15% local match. Now, currently that's been improved because of funds, you know, federal funds, we're a sub-recipient through the state. So federal funds come in and uh, our, our local match <clears throat> has been alleviated through to this year. But uh, on a typical year, we're looking at a 15% local match. And where we get the difficulty is on the fare basis, we, we operate about a $2 uh, on a typical ride fare. And that fare generates a probably um, 10 to 12% of our operating grant, of our operating dollars, but it doesn't cover any of the capital costs. So that usually gets bore on the communities that we um, service. But if you're looking at like these Houston, Hayfield, Rushford area, we're a thousand, uh, these smaller communities that even, even a single bus, the last time we bought a bus was, uh, 2018, we took delivery in 19. That was 97,000, and now we're looking at 130,000 for these small 15 passenger uh, buses. So it's becoming very onerous. These costs are rising uh, tremendously, and it's becoming onerous to on the on the local side um, to get more uh, revenue generated to help offset these costs. And even at the two cent ride. Um, your two cent, two dollar ride. Um, we've seen, you know, we start pushing that up to help kind of offset some of that cost. It does reduce ridership, and primarily who we're covering here in in our service is about thirty percent, or excuse me, fifty percent of our rides are children. That would be uh, preschool. So we're helping out young families getting their kids into school. Um, the other 25% are the student population, uh, probably two of the routes, uh, Stewartville and um, uh, Casson here that operate the majority of the students. So after school activities that use, use the um, public transit to get around. And then about 25% of our, our ridership is elderly, rural elderly. Between that mix, almost 20% of the people are using the lift on the buses. So we have a significant um, you know, need for moving those that have uh, you know disabilities and can't get the steps into the bus or or mobility issues there. So the um, the the ask here, I guess, with the, with something there is just to show that in the in the rural areas. The, the difficulty in, um, in going to the local community to help with some of the offsetting of the costs there becomes very onerous, especially now in our fleet where we're operating with the 15 buses, six of them we have on order now to be uh, delivered here within the next year, and then another three coming for 22. Um, these costs are coming, you know, at $130 a bus, it's hard to pass that on to the to the, to the local community. So some of these one-time fix from the state coming down is uh, is very helpful. So, um, Thank you very much for your testimony. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it and appreciate your work. And it was really helpful to get the breakdown of exactly who you serve and right. the, the diversity of, of, uh, of folks that uh, in your area. So that was, um, you know, all ages and, and uh, various uh you know demographics so it's very helpful um our last um testifier is uh tiffany collins uh director of the central community transit agency welcome to the committee please state your name for the record and uh proceed with your testimony thank you uh, my name is tiffany collins i'm the transit director for the central community transit and we serve Candy High, Meeker, and Renville counties. And I'm also a board member for the Minnesota Public Transit Association. Uh, rural transit providers wear many hats, and this bill addresses many of the challenges that we face. We work very well with the MnDOT Office of Transit and Active Transportation, and they're very supportive of our needs. However, this one-time appropriation would greatly benefit so many transit systems, and ultimately the users that rely on the service throughout the state. We all know that increased fuel prices have, are having an effect on many aspects of transportation, including public transit and volunteer driver programs. With the already low number of volunteers across the state, 
that help link residents to the regional hubs for medical, groceries, work, and other resources. Many are deciding that they cannot continue and public transit is being leaned on to bridge those gaps. Budgets will be strained and with that brings issues with our aging vehicles and the cost to maintain them while we all wait for new buses to be delivered. Maintenance bus budgets will also be challenging to maintain. Uh, local governments find it very difficult to continually provide local match for various transit projects and ultimately some transit systems have attempted, um, not attempted to keep up with technology, adding additional routes, purchasing additional needed buses due to the requirement of the local match. Keeping the local match low will help transit move forward with new innovative technologies such as fare collection, mobile applications, and many others that will increase cost efficiencies, ridership, and having safe vehicles and facilities without overburdening the local cities, counties, and townships to be able to meet the requirement. As a transit director, I meet with all of my county and city representatives dis to discuss transportation projects and request local share for those projects. While they may support those, uh, these advances, there is simply just not enough local funding for all of the other projects that they are being asked to support. Many rural transit providers are interested in the investment in zero emission and electric transit vehicles and would greatly benefit from the assistance with the capital investment as well as the building of the infrastructure for charging facilities in rural areas. I've been involved with two public transit mergers over the last seven years. We know uh, the need and the value of providing transportation from county to county and the public needs options to be able to get to where they need to go when they need to get there. Assistance with long-term planning would greatly benefit um, to ensure the transportations are coordinating well together. There have been great strides over the last several years on coordination, but we can all do better. Lastly, CCT has outgrown its 20 year old facility and has been awarded funding through OTET for the facility itself. But we find it greatly challenging to get those facility plans, the required documentation, perform the resource, and I myself act lack the expertise in the hurdles of land use, zoning, environmental studies, and other processes necessary for the actual build, which many other transit directors have found challenging. So while there is support and funding for many of the transportation initiatives across the state, we simply uh, could benefit from these one-time additional funds to help smooth things um, throughout the state. I appreciate your consideration of this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And uh, now members, we can um, entertain questions and uh, of any of the testifiers or the author, uh, if you have them. Uh, so let me see. Um, I'm uh, scanning our uh, virtual room here and I don't see questions. Uh, so I, um, Representative Bolden, um, Thank you so much for bringing this bill. I've certainly learned a lot about uh, Greater Minnesota Transit here in the last uh, half hour or so, and um, the needs are great. And of course, you've brought forward uh, this important bill, and I think it'll also help your community of Rochester quite a bit as well. So um, if you have any uh, closing comments that you would want to share with the uh, committee, we'd appreciate it uh, before I lay your bill over. So uh, Representative Bolden, last word. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, thank you, committee members, uh, for hearing this bill today. And also thank you to uh, the folks who testified today for your testimony and, and for all the work you are doing in our communities. And uh, Mr. Chair, you are right. The needs are great across the state. And so again, I just would conclude by saying, you know, everyone, uh, regardless of where they live across the state, deserves a transit system that works for them. Um, and this uh, one-time investment would get us closer to that goal. So thank you so much. Well, thank you again, um, Representative Bolden. And uh, with that, uh, I will be laying over, I am laying over House File 4690 for possible inclusion in an omnibus transportation bill. And thank you again. I want to echo uh, Representative Bolden's uh, gratitude towards the testifiers and all the work you're doing in greater Minnesota. Much appreciated. Have a good weekend, Representative Bolden. Okay, members. Um, 
the uh, we have one more agenda item, and uh, I'll. It's not a uh, formal uh, bill, uh, but I wanted to um, just kind of give you some context and and, and introduce this idea, um, and uh, would be helpful uh, for the committee to um, respond and and give some advice and subject some suggestions. Um, this item uh, is a proposal that came to us very recently uh, through the governor's revised supplemental budget recommendations. And uh, this would establish a traffic safety advisory council. And so the language for the proposal uh, that you have uh, contained in your packets is, um, has been developed by the Office of Traffic Safety. Uh, I've reviewed it and um, we'll make some adjustments to it, both uh, the content of it uh, as well as the budget. Uh, it's a, a $4 million allocation. That, again, that was part of the governor's uh, revised supplemental budget. I may be adjusting that. I've talked with the um, Office, of Transportation, uh, Office of Transportation Safety about it, probably revising it slightly downward, but uh, there's more conversation to be had there. Um, but um, this is a, a, an important proposal that I wanted to bring to the committee because uh, traffic safety has been a theme of ours throughout the uh, session. And we started with a whole week of uh, informational hearings uh, regarding uh, pedestrian safety, traffic safety. Uh, yesterday, I was uh, pleased to join uh, Representatives Torkelson and Petersburg at a very moving a press conference uh, out on the front steps of the Capitol. Uh, they had, uh, I think, 502 uh, orange cones signifying all of the traffic that's in the last year in Minnesota. Uh, and I, at that time, um, I mentioned at the press conference that as we come out of the pandemic, we have to now address the epidemic of traffic safety, uh, of traffic deaths and um, uh, injuries on our roads. And so safety, in all of its facets uh, is an important theme for us. We heard the speed camera legislation, we've heard work zone safety legislation this year. And so this is kind of a, a, another idea uh, for how to address it. Uh, I'm very interested in it and uh, believe there's a place for this in our omnibus bill. But again, at a very early stage of development, well, I wouldn't say early, but um, it, it's an early stage of us uh, considering it here uh, in terms of um, actual legislation. And so with that, members, I'm going to ask um, Mike Hansen from the director of uh, the Office of Traffic Safety, no stranger to our committee. He does excellent work at the Office of uh, Traffic Safety to go over the proposal, how the uh, agency came up with it. Uh, I think it was in part due to our hearings, which that makes me feel that we're onto something. Uh, and then really look at the goals and objectives of, of the, uh, the new entity that is being created in this legislation uh, to really build and enhance the work of the Office of Traffic Safety. Uh, so with that, uh, members, I would just like to call on uh, Mr. Hansen and he can go through this proposal for us. And again, very interested to know how the committee feels about this once um, Mr. Hansen is done. We also have Brian Sorensen available for questions. He is the state traffic engineer at MIDDA. So with that introduction, Mr. Hansen, welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Chair. My name is Mike Hansen, and I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Department of Public Safety's Office of Traffic Safety. And uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, I, I really want to, uh, first of all, thank you for giving me some time this afternoon to bring forward to you what I think is a very important proposal, uh, particularly uh, at the point in time that we find ourselves uh, in Minnesota and really across the country when it comes to some of the traffic safety issues and challenges and tragedies that we're facing. Um, Mr. Chair, you, you very succinctly pointed out, you know, the, the real nexus or the, the creation point um, for what we're going to discuss today is 502. That's, that's a number of fatalities that we haven't seen since at least 2007. Uh, 
Um, one fatality is is too many, but 502, it's it's beyond unacceptable. I, I just I, I've run out of adjectives to uh, describe some of the horrific tragedies that are taking place on Minnesota roads. So as a result of, you know, over the last two years, we've seen a 37 percent increase in the number of fatalities taking place on our roadways. And these are on the state highways. These are on the county systems. These are on the city systems and they're on our township roads. And they're not just in the metro. They are statewide uh, we, where we are seeing these significant increases. And so for the last two years, we've worked very hard to try and find ways to address this epidemic uh, within the pandemic of our roadways. Um, it seems, uh, you know, when this COVID challenge came along, uh, COVID brought his evil brother, uh, the bad decision maker, aggressive driver with him. And while we've had some success with what we've tried, um, when we cross into 502 fatalities, the imperative nature of having to do something different to hit the reset switch and really do something bold to change that trajectory is what led to um, our request to form a advisory council uh, for traffic safety. Um, in 2003, the Towards Zero Deaths program uh, was started in Minnesota and has quickly spread statewide. And we've seen a number of really good, successful initiatives uh, come out of that, really from all four of the E's that are involved in that, from enforcement to engineering practices to education and outreach efforts. Um, you know, everything has come together in support of, of what we're trying to do and improve roadway safety. But we've operated a little bit informally. And by formalizing uh, the, the traffic safety governance structure uh, through an advisory council, it's going to allow us to operate in a more cohesive manner. It's going to allow us to bring more resources to the table. Um, and hopefully this committee will agree uh, with us that, that some resources are, are desperately needed um, and can be put to good use. And so with that stakeholder uh, engagement, and really, if you look at the membership that we've proposed, um, and we continue to look at additional uh, membership, um, it, it really does bring all of those pertinent stakeholders to the table that can add to these discussions about what the next generation of traffic safety looks like in Minnesota. And then again, resources and, and funding that comes with that are always going to be important for some of the initiatives that we envision that we would be able to undertake. I want to keep my remarks fairly brief, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and members. I know it's a Friday afternoon, and um, I want to leave plenty of time uh, should members have questions or suggestions for us. Um, you know, the, the why behind this we've talked about, um, you know, traffic safety is a critical public safety issue in many of our communities. Um, uh, the, the the rate that we're seeing the increases at is really somewhat unprecedented. Um, and the causes behind those, while well known, um, are rather difficult uh, to address um, using some of the legacy methods that we have. And so we need to be able to expand our toolbox and put some more uh, tools and some more projects and uh, outreach efforts on the table. And again, as I said, the, this is really the need to take some bold steps and to create some ownership, some accountability, um, and uh, opportunities for all of us to engage with the stakeholders that can and do have a direct effect on the traffic safety uh, arena. So it brings that structure and ownership under a single umbrella. Um, TZD certainly has done some of that, but there are other ways and other projects and programs that we can bring into this. Um, and it will, again, create that cohesive uh, idea sharing environment that, that we can uh, use to benefit all of our projects and programs. The, the council that we have proposed follows the model that many other advisory councils in, in the state also utilize in order to guide their mission and accomplish that mission uh, with good positive results. Um, so this ensures that good stakeholder input 
Um, it ensures our accountability because the, the chair and the vice chairs are going to regularly communicate with the three primary commissioners that, that are involved in the traffic safety efforts. And that would in include the commissioner at the Department of Health, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Public Safety. And so we have that, that, that constant information flow back and forth amongst leadership. It demonstrates commitment to traffic safety on, on, on the side of the legislature, on the side of the governor, and on uh, the side of all of us who are traffic safety practitioners. By, by memorializing and formalizing a traffic safety advisory council in statute, um, that demonstrates a clear commitment to making sure that Minnesota's roads are safe for every user, every day, every trip, all the time. Nobody should be afraid to take a trip, you know, whether it's to church, to the grocery store, or to the cabin up north, uh, because of some bad drivers out there. We know how to address those. We just have to find the rest, the right strategies to do that. And then finally, and I know this committee has heard some of this before, um, many of our projects and programs right now are all federally funded. And federal funds all have matching requirements that, that come with them. Uh, as we look down the road, we see some, some very good opportunities as a result of the new federal transportation bill and the uh, uh, Infrastructure and Jobs Act that were the Infrastructure and Jobs uh, Act that were recently passed. Uh, however, with the additional funding that both of those pieces of federal legislation will provide um, is going to require that we also come up with a, uh, that 20% match that most of our uh, federal programs uh, require. So that is part of the ask um, in the uh, fiscal uh, part of our proposal. So um, I, I know everybody has uh, committee members uh, have the one pager that was prepared and that goes into a little bit more detail than maybe some of my comments did. But uh, again, Mr. Chair, with respect, wanting to be respectful of your time and the committee's time, I'd like to uh, 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 again, turn it back to members for questions and, and suggestions and thoughts for how we can make this work or how we could make it work better. And again, thank you for your time today, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. And uh, members, I'm, we will be making adjustments. What, what you have before you is not the final version, uh, but we would like your ideas and suggestions for that. Um, so um, let me just scan the room. Representative Petersburg, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate uh, this because I, as you know, I was there with you too. I really am concerned about safety because I do believe that people take for granted. Uh, once they get inside this car, I think they make decisions that they normally wouldn't do, and we need to really help figure that out. Uh, but I see a, a quite a large price tag, and, and when I hear uh, Mr. Hansen talk about uh, uh, resources, oftentimes for me, that kind of triggers another word that we often use, which is additional personnel. So are we talking about additional FTEs uh, through this funding as, as well? Representative Petersburg, we are tracking because that was a question I asked Mr. Hansen a couple of days ago. Uh, Mr. Hansen, uh, proceed. Mr. Chair and Representative Petersburg, uh, a good question and a fair question. And um, yes, sir, it does include uh, FTE positions that would... Um, uh, <clears throat> we have a need in the research area. Um, as part of the TZD 2.0 process that we have uh, been embarking upon with MnDOT and our partners at the Department of Health, one of the, the recommendations uh, that, that came out of the study uh, that has taken place over the last oh, 18 months or so um, is also for a program director position for a research position and for a communications specialist to help us coordinate our messaging um, and to, to you know, find that, that messaging, not only the platform, uh, but the delivery method that's gonna be most appropriate for that. Um, certainly we've, we've done some of that in the past, but if we're going to move this forward in a way that is going to make a significant difference and get us back on that downward trend and eventually get us to zero, it is going to take those uh, staffing resources in order to coordinate this effort on a larger scale. Uh, Mr. Chair? Uh, proceed, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you. So if I understand from Mr. Hansen, if you'll continue to, to answer questions here, uh, are these going to be specific to 
the safety council, or are they going to be sharing some duties with other areas? And how will that distribution be if that is the case? Uh, Mr. Hanson. Again, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Petersburg, another really good question. And to a certain extent, some of that is still being studied through the TZD 2.0 process, where each of these positions would be housed um, and you know what they would actually be responsible for. Should the advisory council come into being, um, they would primarily be serving that as part of their uh, uh, responsibilities to the larger, you know, towards zero deaths effort, which again includes DOT, DPS, and MDH uh, as part of that. But it would mean that these positions would be able to focus um, specifically on those issues that the advisory council brings forth. So do the research that the advisory council seeks, do the communications and coordinate the communications amongst all of the agencies uh, that are involved in this when it comes to traffic safety messaging um, and uh, you do the rest of the coordinate project coordination uh, that it would take. Representative Petersburg. Thank you. I'm going to ask the final question and a comment at the same time. Um, my final question is, I think it looks like this funding is for one year. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, Mr. Chair, if you have an avenue for, for future funding. And then it, my comment, I, I guess, is is just the fact that I know that this is you're still kind of working out some of the details. So we'll have more time to discuss it in the final bill. Uh, but um, do you have an idea on future funding? Well, thank you. That's a very good question, Representative Petersburg. I will defer to Mr. Hansen on that, uh, another matter we spoke about. Yeah. Correct. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Petersburg, um, it is actually, it would be ongoing funding um, in order to support the efforts and the matching requirements in order to unlock those additional federal dollars um, that will be uh, coming down the pike um, at some point. Uh, so uh, we would anticipate uh, that uh, the, the funding would continue beyond just the initial uh, fiscal year um, into the future. Um, now, at, at some point, certainly, you know, that, that could be adjusted uh, depending on needs and uh, depending on the successes uh, that we would anticipate we're going to realize there. Um, but that, that would be an ongoing effort. Thank you, Representative Petersburg, for those uh, questions and uh, uh, very, very, um, you know, appropriate ones as we, you know, begin to work through this proposal. Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, first of all, in my opinion, we are dealing with some major behaviors that are just not restricted to drivers. So. The fact that you're including the Department of Health, I think, is a good thing, probably. But I guess you said this is separate from the toward zero deaths. And my question is, if, well, I have two questions, actually. If this is basically trying to deal with the, the death level in particular, why isn't that under that particular program why are you starting something different and that i don't understand and then um well you want to answer that one first representative mason uh thank you for that question uh mr hansen uh, yes mr chair and representative mason and a very good question um the advisory council um as we would envision it is a, a supplement and a support uh, for the Toward Zero Desk Program, or the Toward Zero Desk Program would be a support or a supplement to the Advisory Council. And so, again, what we're trying to do is, is pull together not only, you know, the, everything that has gone into the Toward Zero Desk Program, uh, but to formalize um, the uh, the structure that goes with it. And therefore, we can formalize some of the roles and responsibilities and uh, bring a, a more cohesive and uh, a bit more effective way of delivering the traffic safety programs across the state. So it's not replacing um, the TZD program. This is, this is uh, assisting it or supplementing it or supporting it. Representative Mason. Okay. The second question is, Obviously, well, not obviously, but we know that the, the number of deaths has gone down consistently for the last number, well, 
up until the last couple of years. Were you do was anything done to precip precipitate that decline that did happen versus what his and and this is probably the reason for your committee versus what we're seeing in the these last couple of years. Mr. Hansen. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Mason, that that is an, an excellent point, um, and you are correct. Um, when you know TZD started in 2003, through about 2011 or 2012, um, uh, thanks in in part, uh, in large part, to what the TZD program was able to accomplish, we were able to get the fatality rate down about 40 to 45 percent. However, about 2012, we, we kind of found ourselves stuck on a, a plateau from 2012 to 2019, hovering, you know, right between 350 and 400 fatalities a year, which, again, completely unacceptable. Um, and then, you know, 2020 and 2021 came along, and now we're on, uh, we're almost erasing 20 years of, of progress in the last uh, 24 months. And so that, again, is what is spurring us to, to take this action, uh, this bold action, and request the authorization uh, for this council so that we can do some, uh, some other things that maybe we haven't been able to do in the past to get us back on that downward trend instead of on the upward trend that we find ourselves on. Okay. Do you have Thank a follow-up, Representative Mason? No, thank you. Okay, let me just uh, scan again our room here. Uh, Representative Olson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I guess my question would be, have we evaluated what is wrong or what's not working with the Toward Zero Deaths program? Because I'm, we're looking at creating another thing to supplement something that isn't working. Have we evaluated why it's not working at this current time? Because just creating a program to help the program that isn't achieving what the program was originally created to achieve doesn't seem like good government to me. Uh, thank you for that, Representative Olson. Uh, Mr. Hansen. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Olson, uh, again, a good valid point. Um, and I guess the way I would describe it is, you know, TZD um, really, it, it did have and continues to have a good run. Um, what I would say is that I think the the structure the TZD was founded under um, and where it's at right now, it's, it's outgrown that. And um, it, it, it needs to have some additional structure brought to it. And that's part of the intent uh, with the advisory council is to help guide that, that towards zero deaths program. And with that being said, um, many other uh, um, countries and areas across uh, the nation and across the world who have embarked on a similar type of program. And you might hear the term safe system, which is, is kind of what we're talking about here, uh, also found themselves in the same um, plateau as Minnesota found itself in uh, until 2020. And at that point, it was time to, to step back from kind of we, we took care of the low hanging fruit in the first 10 years, and we solved a lot of, uh, of um, some easier problems that were right up front. And um, I give a huge shout out to my partners at MnDOT. If you just look at cable median barriers, where they've been installed, um, they have virtually eliminated cross median head on events at high speeds, which typically were very uh, highly overrepresented in the fatalities. And so it, it's through those processes but now it's time for us to retrench and to re-envision and to um, reborn, uh, rebirth the TZD program to the next generation. And along with that, the Traffic Advisory Council, Traffic Safety Advisory Council, can be part of that and can help guide that ship as we find the next course to the downward trend that we need to find. Representative Olson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that, that partially answered my question, but I think we really need to dig deep and look at how we can refit a program that's already created as opposed to creating something to fix something that isn't doing the job. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I apologize if, if this has already been covered. I had to step up for a few minutes. You know, we've seen this increase in fatalities here in Minnesota. 
Has there been a similar increase in other states around the country and other countries around the world? Good question, uh, Mr. Hanson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Torkelson. Uh, a very good question. Um, and yes, quite honestly, uh, across the country, other states have seen similar increases, maybe not to the extent that Minnesota has. Um, I just looked at some preliminary numbers today, um, and it looks like in 2021, 46,000 plus um, Americans lost their lives in traffic crashes, which I believe is about 9% above what the 2020 figure was, uh, but also when we look at other developed countries across the world, um, since the pandemic onset, many of them have also seen similar increases. Um, and a lot of us are scratching our heads and wondering how that happened when traffic volumes were down significantly. But um, historically, when traffic volume goes down, fatality rate goes down. But in fact, we saw the exact opposite happen uh, here in Minnesota, here in the United States, and in other developed countries across the world. Representative Torkelson. Well, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that answer. And uh, you know, I think we're all scratching our heads as we watch this uh, happen. Uh, um, and uh, you know, there's, we can all conjecture. I'm not going to do that right now, but but uh, it's something that's worth tackling. I mean, saving people's lives is is critical. Uh, but understanding it's not just it's not just a Minnesota thing. It's not just a even just a U.S. thing. There's something about uh, driver behavior that has been triggered to change. And if we can solve that trigger, perhaps we can uh, get our arms around this. Thank you, Representative Torkelson. Uh, Representative Barr. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's have a comment, um, I guess, more than anything else, listening to some of this. I agree with uh, Representative uh, Olson that this is kind of stupid to re redesign the wheel. Um, and and it, I don't think it, what we're, we're, the piece that we're missing here is the psychological piece behind this. We've designed in a lot of places, especially around the Metro. Uh, we, and I've talked to MnDOT about this at length over the, uh, the last couple of months. Um, some of the engineers at, uh, down at Midna, We've designed highways to actually encourage aggressive behavior as opposed to um, discourage that. One, uh, an excellent example of that would be the new uh, interchange going from northbound 494 to eastbound 94. Uh, that's an excellent example, something that's copied out of California. We don't need to be copying any more California roadway disasters. Uh, that's just one of the many things that we do that, that, that is, uh, encourages bad behavior. Um, as far as traffic deaths going up with less traffic, I don't think it takes a whole lot of uh, thought process to figure out that when you tell people you can't go to work, you can't go to church, you can't go to your community center, and please stay home and don't do anything, that they become rather aggressive and that aggression is taken out on the highway as opposed to taken out on in a, uh, a non aggressive you know, you're upset and that's where people are at. That's, that's a good chunk of why a lot of our traffic deaths went up during the pandemic. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, we need to change what we do or how we, we process these things, but a very aggressive behavior was, was kicked into action through all of the lockdowns and restrictions. And this was the last avenue that people had to uh, to exercise that frustration or or get that frustration out. Um, so that that's one of the big things that is around this. And, and so, like once again, I would say I agree with Representative Olson. We don't need to redesign the wheel. Re we need to recognize the uh, the events around this and uh, stop. I agree. The uh, cable barriers were good. Those kind of things are are great, but. Um, we need to also stop designing highways that encourage aggressive behavior. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Representative Barr, and I always um, appreciate your perspective as uh, someone on our committee that, that drives on our roads professionally, so or, or has done that, and um, so value your perspective. Um, Representative Petersburg, I see your hand up, in a, but I don't know, Representative Torkelson, if your hand is up. Um, 
from your previous comment or you had an additional comment? Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have an additional question. Um, sure. If I remember correctly, um, the uh, increase in fatalities has been mostly in our rural, on our rural highways. Is that correct or am I misremembering that, Mr. Hanson? Uh, Mr. Hanson. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Torkelson, uh, the the increases have really been everywhere. Um, you know, just under half of these are occurring on the state or the federal system, uh, and uh, the the rest of them are occurring on our county road system, on our city systems, and even on our township roads. Um, you know, Hennepin County, uh, 77 fatalities out of the 502. That's the highest that they've seen since I believe 2004. Um, uh, but again, it's not any particular region. Um, it's not metro. It's not greater Minnesota. Um, we are literally seeing this all over the board. Uh, Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you for that. And that, in my mind, would point towards a change in behavior more so than a change. Uh, that has been affected by road design. Thank you. Uh, Represent Petersburg. Yeah, thank you. I just, I, the discussion has kind of triggered some of the things that I've been concerned about for a while, and that has to do uh, with, uh, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for, for a long time, I've kind of believed that we are making cars and making roads uh, safer to be in accidents, uh, safer to have bad behavior rather than dealing with just bad driving skills and behavior. Uh, it's kind of like the difference between uh, if you're an airplane pilot and you crash, um, there's a pretty consequence there. Uh, here, if you're in a car accident, um, it's easy to walk away from that. And I think what's happened is we got to that plateau where all the engineering that we've done and all the things that we've done has now come to the, the most that we can do. Now it's time for us to deal with uh, behavior and and education, and that kind of leads to the question. I'm wondering if the Department of Transportation is actually the best place for for education and getting behavioral change uh, as well. But it's a place to start, Mr. Chair, and I'll be looking forward to seeing it in in your final bill and and working on it there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Representative Petersburg, and uh, I saw Representative Heinrich's hand up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had a couple questions uh, in regards to the, the um, uptick in deaths on the roads. Um, I heard it was said that it was it pretty much uh, statewide spreads evenly between metro and rural. I was wondering if there's any demographic that's overrepresented or underrepresented in, the, in those numbers. You know, is, are we talking, you know, um, 18 to 24 year old males that are just, just choosing to drive 110 miles an hour? Um, so that's kind of one question, you know, the demographic question of who we're seeing uh, are the worst offenders and, and who's experiencing the, uh, um, the ultimate loss of, of death on the roads the most. And then my second question would be um, maybe for somebody at MnDOT, or I don't know if uh, State Patrol is on, but um, has there been any decrease in, in just uh, maybe number of pullovers, uh, whether it's for speeding or expired tabs or what have you? Um, I'd be interesting to see if there's any of those numbers kind of track with the deaths. Um, uh, you know, maybe lack of enforcement is a strong term, but uh, hopefully somebody understands what I'm getting at. Those are my two questions. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, um, Representative Heinrich. And so I think perhaps between um, Mr. Hanson, Mr. Udine is on the line too, I see. And we also have uh, a Mr. Sorensen. So I think any of them can at least answer your second question. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll have uh, Mr. Hanson maybe facilitate this uh, uh, response to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Heinrich. Um, really good questions. Again, I appreciate that from this committee. They're, they're really good questions. As far as the demographics, um, again, males are going to be overrepresented. Um, 60 to 70 percent um, of the drivers involved in fatality crashes are going to uh, be male. Um, Pre-pandemic, you know, we, we really looked at that 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 young unmarried male between the age of 20 and roughly 35 to 40 as being overrepresented. Um, what is somewhat surprising and somewhat mm. puzzling um, and somewhat alarming is that since the pandemic, that age demographic for our males involved in 
fatal crashes is is going upward. Um, these are drivers that you would think would know better, um, but we're now looking at that age 20 to age 45 to 50 and even beyond uh, as being overrepresented, particularly in some of these high speed uh, crashes. And I think it's no secret to any of the members of this committee, speed is by far and away the leading cause of the increase in the fatalities that we're seeing. So that, uh, that gives you a brief picture of the demographic part of it. As far as uh, the enforcement correlation, uh, Representative Heinrich, you are spot on. Um, I've, I've done a couple presentations with Colonel Langer and we use one slide um, that illustrates the number of traffic citations that have been issued in Minnesota over the last 10 years. Um, and we are at about or maybe even a little bit less than half of what we were 10 years ago, as far as the number of traffic citations issued by law enforcement. And when you look at that downward line on the slide, and then we plot the fatality line right next to it, it's almost like those two trend lines are exactly inverse. As that enforcement activity has gone down for lots of different reasons, that fatality line has gone upwards. So we know that Enforcement has to be part um, of what we're going to do moving forward. But along with that, we need to change attitudes. We need to change culture. We need to change driver behavior. And we need to do that through outreach and through education and, and getting people to, to get it. Um, and Representative Petersburg, you know, you make a great point about how cars are engineered these days. When's the last time you saw a TV commercial for how safe the car was? They're pretty rare. You still see them, but most of the time you see drivers doing stuff. Uh, and then you see the caption down below, uh, don't try this at home, professional driver on a closed course. Um, you know, a uh, 19, 20 year old kid can go into a Dodge dealer right now. Um, not that I'm picking on Dodge, but uh, plop down a thousand bucks and drive out of there in a Hemi equipped charger. Um, the, I mean, that's just the, the reality of it. And some of these cars, the horsepower they're coming out with uh, is, is unbelievable. Um, I do know that my friends at uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration are starting to pay attention to that, much like they did back in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. Um, we have to look at what we're putting on the road and in the hands of our drivers out there. Um, Mr. Chair, that was probably a longer answer that you had intended, um, but I would certainly invite um, uh, uh, Brian Sorensen uh, to, to jump in. If uh, Brian, if you have anything to add there that I might have uh, jumped over. Mr. Sorensen. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I, you know, I think the one thing that I would add at this point um, to Representative Olson's question about um, TZD, we, you know, and, and we covered this, Mr. Chair, if you remember back on February 8th, um, we talked a little bit about our efforts with TZD and how we've looked at TZD. Um, we've just gone through about a year process of evaluating TZD and how it could be more effective. And um, this Traffic Safety Advisory Council um, fits into one of the recommendations, actually a number of the recommendations of that effort. And one was to increase the engagement in TZD. And so this, you know, this council would bring together people as part of leading that program that have not been engaged at that level in the past. That includes our city and county partners. Um, that includes uh, Department of Education, Department of Human Services, it includes safety-based organizations such as AAA, um, Safety Council, Insurance Federation, Trucking Association. Um, so this is in response to um, how we can make our TZD program more effective. So I think that's the one thing I would add at this point. And I, I, if I could just add something, Mr. Sorensen, I'm so glad you um, responded. And I think, um, Representative Olson, your question was spot on. I, I've just been thinking, I'm a real supporter of the TZD program and there are fantastic people involved. And I, I do remember Mr. Sorensen, and this is why I appreciate your comments. I went up to a conference, I don't know how many years ago, it was in Duluth. So uh, it was definitely pre-pandemic, uh, but maybe even a couple years pre-pandemic. And, you know, I was impressed at how well attended. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the state, but, you know, the, there was a component that was missing that I really noticed. Uh, and that was, um, you know, community people. I mean, you had a lot of technical people. You had a lot of agency people. 
And so you you mentioned local government, uh, Mr. Sorensen, but you know we have so many groups, and and a number of them have testified uh, before this committee. Um, you know, I think about Mr. Grilly and and uh, the bicycle uh, bike Minnesota. And, um, we we had you know our streets Minneapolis earlier uh, this year, and you know these are groups that are working at the grassroots level on safety issues, and so um, you know not to mention AAA and some of the more established groups, and so I I think there is something mm-hmm. missing, and and uh, so I appreciated your noting that um, Mr. Sorensen, and and again, Representative Wilson, that you know I, I think it's a good it's a Good initiative, but it's incomplete, and and I really noticed that at, at their conferences. But I have to hand it to you: the turnout is amazing, and I think I was invited uh, to one in St. Cloud, and I, I couldn't go again a couple of years ago. And uh, I think I had uh, Representative Wolgamont went instead, and uh, he reported back to me that there were like a thousand people in the room or something like that, and so <laughs> that's that's pretty impressive, but. You know, the people who are not in the room, that's who we need to get in the room. So Representative Heinrich, your uh, hand is still up. I hope that um, everyone has answered your questions, but if you have a follow-up, please proceed. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, I just wanted to thank, uh, well, Mr. Sorensen um, for his uh, input and words, and but especially Mr. Hansen, I felt like those those questions were answered thoroughly. And that was, you know, in, in regards to the, um, uh, trend on enforcement and and maybe less interactions with the public uh coinciding with the with the uptick in deaths I, that was kind of my suspicion so um and then just a comment mr chair i just uh i think one of the things that's that's cool you know we talk about the effects of the pandemic and, and less people on the roads and ultimately it's you know leading to more uh fatalities um, one thing that we haven't talked much about uh, to include is the the uptick in crime as well and um and kind of a disdain you know almost a disdain for law enforcement um, among some groups of people out there and so i think that that could have an effect as well um on what we're dealing with so it's, it's certainly multifaceted but but that was kind of shocking to me uh, mr hansen's testimony in regards to um the trend lines following as far you know less interactions with the public or less less enforcement essentially out there happening so there is kind of a spirit of lawlessness and a spirit of um you know being able to um to try to get away with things that maybe people were a little bit more cautious about before and, and maybe a healthy fear of that they might be, get caught by law enforcement. And we might be dealing with some law enforcement um, uh, thoughts that are like, hey, you know, why am I gonna um, interact with this person um, or, uh, or the public as much as they may be used to to enforce our, our traffic rules. So just wanna make sure that that's, that continues to be a part of the uh, conversation, Mr. Chair. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Representative Heinrich. Uh, next up, we have Representative Elkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm glad that Mr. Uh, Sorensen is here this afternoon. Um, so I've been engaged in a very long running uh, dialogue with the uh, both the city and the county engineers about some of these issues. And I would maintain that uh, one of the things that we need to study is, uh, you know, whether we might actually be over engineering our roads. So, so you know, for the last 70 years, uh, our, our engineers have been uh, designing roads under the uh, assumption that uh, if we just make them wider and straighter, that we'll make them safer. And uh, the available evidence suggests that uh, uh, that they actually the opposite is happening: is that all we do when we make the the the, uh, the streets too wide and too safe, or too too wide and too straight, is people drive faster on them, and the fatality rates actually go up. And so I, I think it's time for us to, uh, as part of this, start questioning some of those assumptions as well. Good point, Representative Elkins. I don't know if anyone uh, uh, would like to respond, either Mr. Sorensen, Mr. Hansen, anyone, if you'd like. It seemed more of a comment, but but a spot on comment, Representative Elkins. I, I know that if, no, no, I don't see Representative Murphy, but I know she might probably comment a little about roundabouts if she were on the call, but. Um, uh, we'll we'll save that one for later. Uh, okay, I don't see. Any... I'm on the call. Oh, you're on the call, Representative Murphy. Do you have a comment about roundabouts? No, I don't have a comment about roundabouts. Let's go on and on. Okay, <laughs> maybe Representative Torkelson does. I see his hand is up. 
I actually don't. I, I think roundabouts actually um, decrease uh, the severity of crashes, but uh, and I have many roundabouts in my hometown, which are a whole other concept. But I, I, I'm a calming with you. event, a calming experience. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, <laughs> Representative Torkelson. <laughs> uh, just what I'm sorry to jump in again, but. Uh, you no, know, please. Long, we this is very, very helpful, Representative. For a long so. time, you know, I've made the comment that I changed the way I drive based on where I'm located. You know, when you're when I'm out here in the country, I am pretty casual, uh, low key. But when I get into the metropolitan area, I just feel I have to drive more aggressively, uh, mm -hmm. just to keep up and not be uh, overwhelmed by <laughs> the rest of the traffic. Uh, perhaps we're all just getting a little too aggressive. I don't know. Just a comment, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I, I know there's a lot of that out there. Um, well, great members, this is really exactly what I had hoped for uh, in terms of a conversation. And I know that myself and um, Mr. Hansen will, will huddle very shortly uh, soon and um, you know take, take some of your comments to heart and make, make some adjustments with this proposal. Um, but I do know that something needs to happen um you know and uh uh groups have to be included that haven't been included and we really need to get our arms around this this is a this is a crisis this is urgent and um you know we have to figure out something innovative and something different uh to uh assist in our response to this and, and again it needs to be multifaceted so I wanted to thank the members and, and thank you, especially um, Mr. Hansen for putting forward this proposal, sharing it with us and uh, you know, the uh, administration for taking this issue seriously enough to put some money behind it. And, um, we just need to make some tweaks. And, and uh, again, I, the, the committee's input is, is hugely important to this and um, appreciated everyone's comments and participation. So with that, members, I just, uh, before we adjourn for uh, the final time in terms of our regular meeting times, I wanted to um, just go over very quickly the plan for next week. Um, and uh, so you can be aware. Uh, so- Mr. Chair, Mr. Mr. Chair, I think you need to lay it over before you move on. Oh, you know what, you're right, sorry. It's it's sort of um, a proposal, it's not a, a bill number, but you know, I will I will formally, Let's see, uh, this is, uh, I, I had it before, it's a revi reviser. I, I, I lay over reviser number 22-07478. It was not really a formal motion, but um, I think you all have in your packets the, um, the uh, matter you know, that we were discussing, but it is not a formal bill yet, but we, we do have language from the reviser. So thank you for that. Represent Petersburg, just so we can make the proper transition here to to the end. Um, so, uh, members, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at one o'clock. Of course, this will be more formally communicated to you, but those are going to be our meeting times. Uh, we um, have that extra meeting on Wednesday, and and as we've done in the past, um, yeah, on Tuesday we will have a. Uh, we will go over the bill with our um, a nonpartisan staff, The call it the rollout of the omnibus bill. Uh, and then on Wednesday at one o'clock, we'll have public testimony. And then Thursday at one o'clock, uh, we will have amendments and discussion and then formally uh, pass what will be a DE amendment to a bill. Uh, and uh, we're gonna go to ways and means. We don't have any tax uh, implications to this bill as we had last bill. Uh, last year, um, and um, we will have an extended meeting on Thursday. Uh, Tuesday will be uh, our normal uh, committee time from 1 to 2.30, and I believe Wednesday will also be 1 to 2.30. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, I, and I know the amount of work now that you have in front of you between now and, and, and when it, it's posted, uh, Two questions. Uh, do you have an idea uh, about when? And, and I know I can't hold you to this. Yeah. But do you yeah. have an idea when it might be posted? And then when, yeah, we're, we, when we are have the, a goal. Yeah. Go ahead, Representative Peterburg. And, and then what? When would be the deadlines for amendments? That's it. Yeah. Um, so you know we have a goal of around. You know we hope. What I will say, and this is just boy, there's 
we always appreciate Mr. Lee and Mr. Burns, but oh my gosh, this time of year, you know, what they're balancing. And, you know, what I will say is I think we got started a bit earlier this year than uh, in the past. There's still a crunch here at the end, but, you know, I think our goal is to, to really have this in a, sh in, uh, there's going to have to be, um, you know, some edits and then it goes to the reviser. Uh, certainly, uh, relatively early in the day, Monday, I think would be a, a goal of ours to, to have this um, available sometime Monday, uh, the earlier, the better. And then, um, you know, you'll have about, you know, we'll have a couple of days to, to mull it over. And then, uh, uh, you know, I haven't really discussed this with Mr. Howe, but, um, and I will, I'll want to discuss it with you, Representative Petersburg, you know, what is a reasonable time for amendments because this is a big bill we don't have a lot of time so we might uh you know ex you know waive the 24-hour period um and, and maybe it's a 12-hour period i don't know but i would like to discuss that with you over the weekend right. represent petersburg um you know again it's just uh you know the this, this is the, uh, the the time of year where, where things get uh you know condensed in a short period of time but we we have to do everything we can uh, to make sure that not only you but the public have an opportunity to really weigh in and see the bill. And I, I will say um, there won't be a ton of surprises just simply because we've heard every bill uh, or every concept that's going to be in this bill. And um, but you know it looks different when it's all <laughs> when it's all in one consolidated form. And then of course the budget items too. So. Um, I'll be in touch with you and, and hopefully we can uh, collaborate and come up with a, uh, a system that works for everybody. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the fluidity that we have to do at this time and maybe we'll have more information about the uh, conference committee issue as well. But uh, thank you for all your diligence and work and putting uh, working together. And I really appreciate um, the, the ability to be able to talk with you and, and work things through with you. Uh, I appreciate our working relationship very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, me as well. And, you know, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for, uh, uh, you know, thank yous next week. Um, but again, this is, this is an opportunity to thank uh, our staff on both sides of the aisle and our nonpartisan staff for just an incredible year of work. And, and we have more ahead, but, um, you know, it's a, it is a, a bit of a milestone to have our, our, our last regular meeting and now we move into to a whole nother uh, uh, phase of our work together. So uh, with that members, uh, we are adjourned uh, until Tuesday, but we will uh, pay attention of course, closely to your emails so that, uh, and then uh, our, our committee website uh, for the bill posting and look forward to our work together next week and beyond. With that, have a wonderful weekend and we are adjourned.